The Spin-Off Podcast Network. This is Kiwi is back for a brand new season with more inspiring kōrero from special guests including rugby player, father and role model TJ Peronara. My family bring me joy. Rugby brings me joy too, but it's not the same joy as my family brings me. And global dancer and choreographer Kirsten Dodgen. For some reason people think I'm very intimidating. Listen to the new season of This Is Kiwi, brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network in collaboration with Kiwi Bank. Available now wherever you get your podcasts. Hello for lover. I'm Madeline Chapman, editor at The Spinner. If you have the means, consider supporting our high-quality journalism by becoming a Spinoff member. Sign up now at thespinoff.co.nz/donate. Nair is public interest journalism funded through New Zealand on air. Now my haere mai fakatau mai ra he ko nei purangi te nei pana kite ao Maori me te ao huri huri. I'm Leonie Hayden. This is a podcast about being Māori in the modern world. Ko hinga te tōtara o te awao nui a tāne. He mai mai aroha, te moana nui a Kiwa Jackson. I tērā wiki, Aotearoa lost a rangatira. Wana Jackson was my hero. I didn't know him well, but I met him many times in my career as a journalist and corresponded with him many times more. Unfailingly, whenever I wrote something that resulted in lots of angry emails from Māori and Tawiwi readers, there would be an email from Wana giving his thoughts on the kaupapa and telling me to be brave. Those were the only emails I had eyes for. It was the only feedback I cared about. One email from one in particular stopped me from quitting media altogether. I wrote recently for the spin-off that Moana taught me that a mind is a weapon, and this sentiment was echoed by a few of his peers at his tangihanga over the weekend, with one kaifai kōrero likening his hinangaro to a taiaha and his arero, his tongue, to a mere paunamu. Moana Jackson was a lawyer and a constitutional expert, I, uh, but he was a storyteller. It felt less like he was trying to educate us and more like he was simply reminding us of things that had become obscured. He reminded us that our men were not just warriors once, but also gardeners, storytellers and the gentlest of fathers. He reminded us that our intellectual traditions were wise and strong. He somehow placed the puzzle pieces of history and colonisation together so neatly, drawing a really clear picture that even the most stubborn conservative had to see it. Although I once sat near Don Brash at a talk by Matua Moana and the fact that he continues to be the Karen that he is is a testament to how impenetrable racism can be and why Moana's work will never be done. Matua Moana worked in other indigenous communities and he studied centuries-old texts to better understand the far-reaching global effects of Europe's doctrine of discovery, the framework for Christian explorers to lay claim to indigenous lands. He stood on every possible policy and strategy front line where Māori are marginalised. The justice system, Oranga Tamariki, the foreshore and seabed, Ihumatau, fisheries, broadcasting, the arts and many more that we never heard about. He authored Whaipanga Ho, which proposed dramatic justice reform, Matiki Mai, which proposed dramatic constitutional reform, Y262, the landmark flora and fauna claim. He was a rebel. He was in the first Māori delegation and later became chair to the working group that drafted the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And he used Pūrāko, anecdotes from his own Fano and his huge knowledge of world history and geopolitics to gently, always so gently, make very complex layers of trauma quite easy to understand. Uh, Rumour has it he politely declined a knighthood until the Crown would fully accept the Treaty of Waitangi and all that went with it which I love, um, and as so many other tributes have done, our thanks and our gratitude go out to his whānau and his hapu for sharing this great man with the world. Like the maunga in the story he liked to tell about his koro, the perspective on and the context for his life and work will be ever-changing, but his legacy will forever be a part of the landscape of Aotearoa.
Hoki mai anō. Uh, I am joined once again with the Metes, Mariana Johnson and Te Kuru Jews. Kia ora kōrua. Kia ora hoa. Tēnā koutou. Um, as you both know, um, Te Kaupapo Te Rānei is uh, our hero, Moana Jackson. Aye. Um, and we're just going to have a little bit of a, a chat about what he meant to us, some of our favourite things about him, some of the favourite things that he said. And um, what's your sort of understanding of Matua Moana? When did you sort of come across him, Miriana? Well, I sort of came across, I mean, his reputation preceded him. He would be referenced by interviewees, particularly when I was doing stories about Justice Kopapa regularly. And I was like, who is this man? I looked him up and I just was at a time when I was still working out what things like Tina Wuranga Teratanga meant and what how that could be realized. He gave the words, he had the words to describe what that meant, what that future could be. And I was just blown away by how incredibly articulate he was and how he managed to yeah, put words to concepts that were spinning me up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, how do we turn this, turn this, you know, bus around in you know, 180 years of colonization? And he would just lay it out, takoto, takoto. Um, incredible, incredible speaker. I... And I always found it, Really fascinating. And um, sadly, and I'm really spoty about this now that he's um, passed, Moi Moi Rai Rangatira, never got to see him talk in person, watched a number of his talks online, and I've interviewed him at least once. I interviewed him for a police racial profiling story. Um, but what struck me is so many people have been commenting on is how softly spoken he is, mm. and yet how powerful his corridor is. You referenced it in, in your uh, corridor at the start, Leonie, about his uh, mind being a taiaha and his tongue being a mere mere. And I saw that corridor going around on on Twitter. Um, Stacey Morrison shared it, and it was Joe Williams mm. who who yeah. And then I love the next part of it, which was Ingare he arero mere mere tonu. <laughs> and I feel like that sums it up. You know, his voice was soothing and it softened. The, I mean, because what he was talking about, calling out racial profiling, calling out racism, you know, talking about dismantling colonization, yeah. you know, huge, huge, powerful, scary things for a lot of people. And, and, but the way that he expressed it just made it all better. Clear enough for like kids to understand, I feel, but not childlike. I do. Um, the one thing I love about the way he speaks is I actually tweeted this like over a year ago. Um, you know, some people listen to podcasts to fall asleep. I listen to <laughs> Moana Jackson <laughs> keynote <laughs> speeches. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it's like, it's because his um, his way of speaking is super soothing, but also a part of me just hopes that, like, I'll absorb all that amazing knowledge while I'm asleep and then, like, wake up smarter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how it works, eh? Yeah, waking up and you're dreaming about dismantling colonisation. Oh, yeah. You wake up, you're like, oh, <laughs> I just had a beautiful corridor with a friend um, on the day past and, and we were reflecting on how awesome it is to have a tāne in leadership like Matua Moana. Mm. You know, he showed us that being ready and, and fiery isn't the only way to to communicate and, and to push our kaupapa. Yeah. Anyway, ka fiu a te rākau ki a kukuru. <laughs> I could go Aye. on. <laughs> <laughs> Aye, tēnā tātou, tēnā tātou i uh... Uh, ya Papa Moana Jackson, uh, ko ia te ra, ko eke ki te, uh, ki te au o ake ake, nā reira kare wake ai tēnei kōrero ki runga ki aia, he rangatira, uh, he tawira, he māngai, mutunga mai o te humārie, uh, o te ngākau whakaiti. E rā, a huatanga o te rangatira e ngākau nuitiana e te motu. Nā reira i arohana ki te whānau pani, tēnei he f- pānga o te whānau a uh, hine rupe e mihi atu ana uh, e tangi atu ana ki aia o tira ki tōna whānau. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, I think our people are hurting, eh? It's mm. quite, it's a difficult one. It's like when Papa Huirangi uh, passed in Aye. recent years, uh, there is no one else like Moana J. And even mm. for those of us who didn't have a, a personal or intimate relationship with them, um, our respect and admiration for 
his vision, his mind, uh, what he achieved, but also what he represented for us. He was like hope. He was mm. he was it. He was the guy. And, and it's just, Anna. I feel like our people are really hurting and we've, we've seen and we've heard an outpouring of grief, not only at the Tangihanga over the last few days, uh, but online as well. Mm. Uh, those who didn't make it. And also, as we're well aware, there have been lots of discussion around uh, kōrero, around what took place at his tangi, and I'll be looking forward to getting into that with our manuhiri. But Aye. yeah, just, yeah, there, there, has, there haven't been rangatira like him before, and there will probably be none like him again. He was that unique and that Aye. special, and just really happy that we're acknowledging his legacy in this episode today. Aye. And one of the things I loved uh, about Matua Moana is his belief in the intellectual strength of women. One of the the things that has really come through over the past few days, and as was sort of um, a lot of people will have seen in the media and social media, it was one of Matua Moana's last um, wishes for Wahine to speak on the pai at his tangihanga, which uh, his whānau at Matahiwi Marae agreed to, respected that wish. And it, it, it is a very interesting topic of conversation, which, it, like Te Kuru says, we'll get into um, later with one of our manuhiri. But more than, than just that, it was his ability to, no matter who he was talking to, he really was talking to you, and he really wanted to know what you thought about, which is a ridiculous feeling when you're talking to just an intellectual giant. The very first time I interviewed him, I almost stopped interviewing him because I was like, I, I can't even, why do you even care what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But, you know, he just said he drew that out of you, just like, and then you'd find yourself actually telling him what you think about stuff. And, and, and then that is why he knew who should stand by him when he was doing his important research because he stopped and he listened to all of the people that he worked with. And so he's worked with all these amazing women, Anne Wapu, Julia Faiporti, um, who are going to carry on the crazy, amazing work that he has been doing for decades and decades. Um, so while we're grieving, and it is a huge loss. I, I do love that um, he, he nurtured a whole new generation, more than one, of people to carry on his work, tāne, wahine, ngātangasaka katoa, like he, I don't know if he thought of it as a succession plan, mm. but it sure was a good succession plan. Yeah. Mm. A sign of a true leader is enabling others to Aye. Uh, grow their own potential and foster their own ability to lead others. So, yeah, he tohu tērā ki te rangatira. Aye. O te tangatara, te rangatira tanga o moana jī. Yeah. And I don't even, you know, was he even aware of just how widespread his influence was. You know, as Takuru said, there's so many of us that are mourning who didn't have a close personal intimate relationship. But he, he gave us all that hope that actually we can can still achieve our rangatira tanga. I know he was the first leader I looked to or who articulated that vision who made me believe in that. Mm. Yeah, that's that's pretty transformational. So his work the way that he spread those the seeds of his knowledge out to everyone and the way that they've grown. You know, there's a whole movement that, we, you know, we're only just seeing now. I'm sure, there's still fuffi around co-governance, et cetera, but there's so much more acceptance from, um, you know, people of this country that there needs to be mm. power sharing. And he was articulating these things, you know, three decades ago. Mm. Yeah. I mean, he was way ahead of his time, but the legacy he's left behind is this whole movement and, and the whole generation, generations of people Ngai Māori who've been, and Ngai Pākia Anu Hoki, Ngai Tangata Katoa, who've been empowered by his vision for a future where we live in partnership and Rangatira Tanga is restored. Right. If only the government was listening. Oh, <laughs> Imagine if they had en- enacted the changes that he laid out in the 80s and before and after, you know, and it was always seen as so radical, radical transformation but we know it wasn't that radical. It was just restoring our rights to us mm. and restoring our mana to us. And that, I think, just underpinned everything that he stood for. Is it's not, um, We're not asking for something that we're not entitled to. We're asking for our mana to be restored in the eyes of the kawanatanga, obviously, not in the eyes of our own people. I mean, that's the lesson of the last 180 years, isn't it? You know, kore ngā tāringa o kawanatanga. Aye. Aye. It's <laughs> <Tiri. laughs> Can you all tarring it? <laughs> Hi. Um, do you guys have any favourite quotes from Matua Moana? I've got a collation here because most people know I've got a relationship with the statues. 
colonial uh, statues, right. and I'll jump at every opportunity I can to do a story on those, <laughs> uh, especially here where I live in Turanganui Akiwa. Uh, there is a, a long history of um, idolization of Captain Cook, mm. this being the first place where he landed, and Moana in a couple of e tangata articles, which our listeners um, are more than welcome to pop over and have a read and support and totoko the amazing work at Itangata. All right, definitely. Um, some of the quotes that I've pulled from those articles in the past I've got here, and I'll just choose one out. So here's an intro one, I guess. Colonizers have always built lots of monuments, both at home in Europe and in the lands of the indigenous peoples they've dispossessed. They too are a point of view and stand as fabrications, rationalizing their power and their right to places that were never theirs. And I'll just scroll through a little bit more. Mm. As I read it, I'm imagining it in his voice, right. which is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you need to do it very softly and slowly. And then a bit slower. Do that. I loved that little intake of breath through his nose that he would do mm. between sentences. Mm. I just found that really reassuring. Yeah, we, we don't have the right voices for this, do we? We've all got <laughs> booming broadcasting voices. We do, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he talks about, he says, the first killings in Turanga are reframed as an unfortunate encounter marred by misunderstanding and bloodshed. But in the history of colonization, indigenous people were always killed in the first meetings with the colonizers. That narrative is the story of New Zealand's nation building that Cook has always been credited with initiating. It's a variation on an old story about legitimizing the power that was first asserted in his acts of discovery. It's also the story of how the colonizers have tried to find a new identity by morphing themselves from colonizers to settlers and then Kiwis. And I bring that one up because I've, I've mentioned it in a few episodes before and Aotearoa isn't ready for us to start calling out the term Kiwi. Uh, but, <laughs> but we're, we're going to do it will. anyway. In the next 10, 20 years, it'll become more acceptable and people will start to reflect more on that term. And it's lucky that we've got someone like him who has written on it and has articulated mm. thoughts about it. He didn't go you know, he didn't go hard on it, but he's just stating it as it is. Mm. And that was what was so great. And the videos that have been shared on social media as well, where he's shutting down people like Brownlee and these other ignorant Pākehā who have oh. no idea about what they're challenging Māori about. Yeah. And he just says, well, actually, bro, matter of fact, this is what it is. And yeah. you can almost see it in their face like, oh, okay, I understand yeah. now. So I guess we're lucky to have those recordings. His rebuttal of Jerry Brownlee is iconic. I, that is actually iconic, eh? It got mentioned a lot at the Tangi, actually. I started to feel a bit bad for Jerry Brownlee. <laughs> it's just getting <laughs> laughed at by hundreds and hundreds of people again and again. Mm. Isn't it amazing? It's one of those rare moments where you see a politician, act, like he does actually seem to be really listening mm. and he's not trying to interrupt. I mean, you know. He was getting schooled. He was getting educated. Uh, and, he, and he took his schooling. <laughs> But yeah, I love how in that court it all, you know, from that Marae debate with Jerry Brownlee, he so he does such an amazing job of saying, well, you you know, you've acknowledged these Maori need here, so obviously that need has a right has arisen from certain rights being breached. Mm. And therefore, you cannot address the need if you don't address the breach of rights. Right. And it's just like, yeah, boom, boom, mic drop, Matua Moana, the man. But I'm glad you brought that up to Kuru because that's one of those iconic videos. Eh, that you just want to show everyone, any person who brings up the whole Māori special rights and privileges, it's like, oh, mate, have a look, watch <laughs> yeah. this. <laughs> Here are some resources. <laughs> have you got any favourite quotes, Mariana? Um, so, yeah, when they launched the uh, book, Imagining Decolonisation, there's a, a beautiful line in, at the end of it that he gives in the corridor. He, he always had this way of talking about, you know, these really tomaha topics like colonisation and, and the need for decolonisation and you know, the, the num number of our people who are locked up in prison, but giving you hope at the end. And yeah, this quote kind of you know, speaks to that. It seems to me change can often be difficult, but it is a wonderful difficulty because it challenges the intellect, it challenges the courage, and it challenges the ability to dream. I don't know, something about that quote kind of relieved a bit of the tomaha of the enormity of the transformational shifts that need to take place Hi. in Aotearoa. And so, yeah. And then there's also one that's been doing the rounds on social media, which is, I think, is just stunning. We are not alone in our struggles. We stand in the light of our ancestors. Kia ora. And that one's really, yeah. Kia ora. It's almost like he needs to be a subject on his own or him along with other influential Māori academics, if you're a 
tertiary student or something studying New Zealand context, you need to have the writings of Moana need to be oh, absolutely uh, compulsory. required reading. Yeah, required yeah. Reading. I don't, uh, yeah. I don't know if his illness allowed for it, but I just I really really hope that he had some kind of input to the new history curriculum on New Zealand history that is about to be introduced. Mm. I really hope, or at the very least, they drew on his matauranga in order to create that. Surely, eh? Well, this is probably a challenge for us to honour his legacy, is to Aye. make sure that we keep eyes and hands on those kaupapa going Aye. forward. Mm. Uh, well, speaking of the next generation uh, coming up after the break, um, we're very lucky to be joined by uh, a young Law student, Victoria University law student, has been hugely influenced by Moana Jackson and his work and also has a personal connection with Matua Moana. Uh, so we will be joined by him after the break. Kia ora, I'm Duncan Grieve, founder of The Spin-Off. You can help us keep all of The Spin-Off's award-winning journalism free for everybody by becoming a member today at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. Do you find it hard staying optimistic with all the financial news in the media? I'm Bernard Hickey, and on my podcast, When the Facts Change, I'm here to help you navigate the ever-changing landscape of economics in Aotearoa. So join the conversation every Friday on When the Facts Change, brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network in partnership with KiwiBee. Hoki mai anō, uh, it is our great honour today to be joined by the next generation of uh, decolonial leaders and thinkers and law students. We're joined by Safari Hines. Uh, he's a rangatahi Māori and law student of Victoria University, just like Matua Moana. Uh, uri anō Ngāti Kahungunu. Uh, you or one of your friends may have shared his beautiful kōrero about Moana over the past few days that have been uh, doing the rounds. Uh, no mai, haere mai e hoa. Kia ora, Safari. Tēnā koe, tēnā koe tau. Thank you so much for joining us. As a lot of people would have seen, um, you shared a lot of uh, Matua Moana's thoughts, some of his best quotes, um, a lot of advice that um, he had given to you. In your own words, do you want to sort of start by telling us, like, how how has he influenced um, what you do? Yeah, if, if I can say, when I came into university, I wasn't doing any of this mahi <laughs> at all. And it was following Fire Margaret Mutu and Matu Warner. It was following their mahi through the, the Iwi Chess Forum that I was able to jump in and sort of realise what was going on. And, and slowly and slowly, reading more about the work they were doing, had done, watching his videos was probably the biggest thing for me on mm. YouTube and on Facebook. I'm an oral learner, and so it's much easier for me to just sit down and watch a video of him shooting someone to tears like uh, Jerry Brownlee <laughs> um, and go, oh, yeah, I'm going to remember that one. And, yeah, that was sort of how I was introduced to him. I was actually introduced to him at the Tangihanga for Henrietta Maxwell uh, a few years back in uh, Wainua Matamurai, and he'd come back for her Tangihanga. My mum introduced him to me, and I talked about wanting to be a law student, and he told me that Waikato University had a really good uh, law program. Fast forward a couple of years, I met him at the Victoria University um, we had a workshop for Laws One Two One, and I says, "Oh, do you, uh, do you remember meeting me? You know, a couple of years back, I met you at Fai Henry at Maxwell's Tangi, and you told me I should go to Waikato." And he said, "Ah, I mustn't give very good advice if you're now here at Vic." <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, um, that was how I got introduced to him, and then just stayed in contact after that. When you started at Vic, um, did Moana come to your cohort and ask the question that he asks? New Māori law students, did he ask you, are you a lawyer who happens to be Māori or a Māori who happens to be a lawyer? Yeah. Um, he asked that in this Laws One to One MPI workshop. And you know those moments where you like got that question and go, Oh, that was <laughs> deep. And you all just like look at each other and you're like, Whoa, oh, wow. Or, like, that, that was one of those moments for me. I... So yes, no, he, he did ask that question and that's always been on my mind and I'm always um, reminding, you know, my peers as well. It's like, you know, whānau, our duty is to our people first 
we're here to do something and but ensure that we're Māori first. Mm. Was that something that when he first posed that question to you, did you know like straight away you're like, yeah, yeah, he Māori tuatahi, he roi ya tuarua, or was it something that over the course of a few years that you were like, actually, my services to my people first? To be honest, it was something I, I hadn't really thought about. I was pretty strong in my Māori tanga, but I guess I probably didn't understand how one could consume the other, mm. how being a law student could you know, consume you to the point where you perhaps start um, moving more to being a lawyer and the importance of um, you getting uh, to, to become a lawyer one day and work for a nice law firm that eventually that goal might consume your your Māori tanga and your, your dreams to your people at the end of the day and then you might be more focused on, you know, getting to a, a nice law firm with a nice salary, getting a nice job and then that for Carl consumes your actually no, I'm here to get enough skills to come back and help my people mm. kind of thing. Did you see any of that influence on any of your um, non-Māori peers in your in, at law school? Yeah. Asians for tinoranga tiratanga. Aye. Well, they're probably some of the most uh, like amazing group of like Toby people I've ever sort of encountered. And Darren, who was actually my laws one to one um, tutor at that workshop when I re met Moana, he he was the one who had asked Moana to come. And Darren is probably the Toby person who's not Pakeha, who I could definitely say was just as impacted by Moana as as I was, and so on um, when. Asians for Tira Ranga Tira Tanga come onto the marae the other day mm. um, and, and had a quarter or and yeah, a very profound impact, not just on Māori, but on um, many non-Māori. We've heard stories of um, some great quarter. Uh, it spreads around the motu as it does <laughs> in our culture of oral literature. We've heard that there have been some great speeches over the week. What were some memorable moments for you? Probably the big highlight was having wahine talk for me. Having not seen that myself and only heard about it, having wahine talk was the most pr- profound thing. And not just talk, but sitting in front of the pie as well. Mm. Mm. So when Justice Joe and them come on, um, fight, and it comes up next to me, and I was like, oh, true, because some of the wahine who had spoken were sitting um, in the second seats. So having Wahine speak, having them sit at the front of the pie fire, Sharon Campbell, I think it was, when she um, she come from left field, the pie pie's over here, and she come and <laughs> with her, um, her ones flanking her, like, oh, oh, te tapu, oh, moody, wai, and they just walk up and go and take a stand right after the, uh, you know, the maid who's meant to keep going, but they're like, nah, we're going to get up and talk. I was like, hey, shot you, fellas. <laughs> Kiengi Kiriona's kōrero was beautiful. He put down the wero to rename the Kurimako Award for Ngamaru Kōrero um, after Moana. Awesome. There was a, another Kōrero, I can't remember who it was, it might have been Nga, who said that Ngāti Kahunguru needs to tell the government that in the Te Tiri Te Waitangi section for the New History in Schools, mm. that um, Moana needs to be included in that so that every student coming through the schooling system knows about Moana mm. in the context of the TDT. Oh, we? Yeah. Oh, we were just talking about that and we were hoping that yeah. something like that would be the case. So that's awesome that someone's put that word all down. On the last day, um, on the Nihu, we were all just sitting there and there was a bit of time. <laughs> and she goes, so I think we should have a wānanga, you know, you know, just get up because the last group to come on was Ngāti Whātua. And Te Kura Taioho brought up the, the issues that Ngāti Whātua were having with the, the, the sort of court cases mm. and and asked for or asked for advocated for tikanga within the common law. And, and I sort of said towards the end, you know, kātū pato, um, because that's a, that's a big debate. And then fast forward to there being time and fighting, and said, we should have a wānanga, you know, like just tikanga in the common law. And I said, okay, cool, what do you want me to do? She goes, start it. And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? She's like, yep. A little back and forth then anyway. We started talking and I started talking and I handed it off to her. And gosh, she's an inspirational speaker. Mm. Um, there were lots of, there were there was David Williams, Max Harris, um, Ani Mikaide, mm. uh, John Minto and all of these different people got up to come and speak and have a wānanga. They would talk about moana, then they'll talk about the kaupapa of tikanga and the common law. Um, and it was beautiful Bye. to watch because Fai Ani said some really beautiful things because on the pie the day before, um, Justice Joe had said that 
uh, Mona was in a luxurious position, not having to be in Te Korokoro or Te Parata. And Justice Joe, he had said that Moana was in a luxurious position and only sort of said, well, there's no job security in being the country's conscience. <laughs> and, and Fight Annette as well talked later about how hard it was. You know, often we, we, we talk about the great things that they did, that he did, but then we really forget at times how hard it was mm. for them, mm. how not everyone's actually um, on your side for most of the time. And we have to be more than passive bystanders for all of these copa but sitting there going, yep, you go hard, more. No, yep, you go hard. And Ed, you go, you fight them. And actually going, I'll come with you. I'll stand with you. Yeah. I'll fight with you. Can't just toe talk or from, you know, behind the scenes or, you know, from your computer screen in bed being like, man, caught it all to it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, that was the thing is I was like, you know, the, the, the best thing, you know, and I say this to law students as well all the time because sometimes they think they're really saving the world by becoming a lawyer kind of thing, <laughs> which, is, which is fine and great. But, you know, the best thing that all of us can do is to go home Bye. to our marae and ask what help they need and how you can help. Because if we conceptualise our marae as our sites of power, where we exercise te nuranga tiratanga, you know, the thing that we're saying in 20 years we, we, we're going to have fully to ourselves and we're not going to have any crown interference, that power we're supposedly going to have in 20 years is going to be exercised in one place, mm. the marae. Mm. So we have to make sure that our marae have the capacity and that our people have the capability to be able to hold on to all of that power. So at a very baseline level, you know, what's the point of having a whole lot of lawyers, a whole lot of doctors, a whole lot of whatevers, if at the end of the day none of them are going back home to their marae, right, okay. none of them are going back home, and then fast forward, you know, 20 years, they're actually, as a people, unable to hold their power because mm. um, they haven't been focusing on building up their marae. Anyway, yeah. Right. I love that corridor around the marae as a site of power because – I was listening to the Tetiriti based futures corridor that Margaret Mutu did the other weekend about Mataki Mai um, and, you know, talking about constitutions. And I never studied law, so I'm like, well, you know, what is this? Yeah, Dan um, And yeah, you're talking about that they're a cultural creation and that, you know, they're based on the concept of power and the side of power. Um, and I love that you know, that the marae is where we still maintain that Tinoranga Tiritanga. So that's where we should be putting a lot of our energy, eh? And that's a space that we have, we still have sovereignty. Um, and I loved, there was a, at the end of the quarter, or someone asked, well, how can we progress the recommendations of Mataki Mai, which for our listeners is, as I think actually has already been mentioned, a report that um, Matua Moana Jackson worked on. And um, Margaret Mutu said, actually, every single whānau and hapū is within their power to make their own decisions and we need to return back to that drawing upon the tikanga of our komatua, whoever, whoever your komatua may be, whether you're Tauiwi, Pākehā, Māori. And that was a really empowering mm. or to hear because when we're looking at the massive picture as Moana did, you know, the, the transformational change that's required of our constitution of the country, it can be quite overwhelming, you know, as an individual, as, as a Fano. But actually here's one way we can... Um, yeah, assert our rangatiratanga in our spaces. And so what does that future look like for you, Saf? Um, you have obviously having various wedo passed down to you by the likes of Matua Moana and Annette Sykes. Where do you go to in your studies and your mahi from here? I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not personally sure about where I'm going. I'm sure of where I'm not mm. going. And, and that's as a lawyer and as a politician, not interested at all. Mm. But but I sort of sound so, I don't know if this sounds cliched or weird, but I, I want to sort of be like Moana um, and, and sort of be able to jump in between and be really, really flexible and be able to help my iwi at a grassroots level because, you know, in terms of my people, for me, we're really culturally deprived. And so for us spending a lot of time building us up culturally so that tinoranga tiratanga can be a goal that we can eventually seek to realise for my people. But while my people are over there, me helping at a, at a, at a national level or at another hapu iwi level to help others, um, that's, that's what I'm happy to mm. do. Because Mona said to me once, because um, I says, you know, 
what do I do? I'm like, I've got this iwi here who's pretty good with their culture, so I reckon they could be good with their, you know, I could go over there and help them with tinoranga tiritanga, but this one over there, they can't even get a pie together. So how do you want to hold your tinoranga tiritanga when you can't even hold your pie? And then he always said, be wary and always think about where your people are at. He says, all of our people are at different stages. Mm. Tuhoi are at a far different stage about realizing mana moti hake and tiunduranga tiratana mm. than my people. He says, so for you, Safari, it's about realizing where your people are at and making sure that you bring them all on the journey. Hi. Atahua. Um, and I was going to um, ask for what the best advice Moana ever gave you, but if it is what you've just told me, then go to play. <laughs> and this is hard because there were, there were lots of things. The complete way I think and the trajectory on on where I'm heading in life is entirely because of him Mm. and and I haven't quite known how to articulate that in the last couple of days and trying to say thank you to him and I'm sort of like everything that I do and am in in love with right Mm. now you know is because of you and Fire Margaret and the complete way I think about Te Tiriti and our rights and where, where I hope we go is because of him and because of them I was sitting down with him once and I said um what what do you think the biggest thing that colonization took from us. And he said, belief. And I said, then I was like, belief. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking, land or, you know, culture. <laughs> he goes, belief. I was like, airy, fairy stuff is this, you know, because, you know, I'm really, I, I, I try to be a very straight talker kind of person. And, um, and then, you know, he went away to, to explain and he said, you know, the, the saddest thing is that is we now people don't believe in the value of our language. They don't believe in the value of our culture. They don't believe in in the systems that we had pre uh, the arrival of Pākehā. And they don't believe in the ability of those systems to carry us into the future. Mm. And then I clicked and I was like, ah, that's what you meant by believe. (laughs) I thought you meant sitting there, you know, Kraitiana believe kind of thing. Um, And and that sort of um, was important to me because, you know, Lots of the time with, with these things we talk about to Tiriti and all of these arguments and debates that we have, a lot of them are, are up here. They're, they're, they're debates from minds to minds. And he sort of reassured to me that as, as well as having the debate from, from mind to mind and being correct logically, that there is the, the, the heart element or the, the emotional mm. element of bringing people on side of making people feel like, you know, te Māori is theirs and that these systems are theirs and that they believe and they're proud of themselves because that's, that's not often stuff talked about when we talk about when there's, you know, in, in te tiriti discourse, it's all very up mm. here. It's, a, it's all going the interpretation of this and how this would have meant in this context. and Legal definitions yeah. and redefinitions and interpretations. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and he made sure that we don't forget that as, as, as long, uh, as well as the conversation being from mind to mind, it's also from from hearts to hearts to try and tahuru my people. And and I think um, Fai Ali said this on the last day as well, which was um, you'd be sitting there and he could turn people from, you know, they would walk into the workshop and then by the end of the workshop they were walking out going, yes, Māori should rule the world. <laughs> you know, that was sort of his, his ability of telling a story and then sort of asking you questions and leading you down a path where you yourself answered the question, mm. and and I and I said that you know easily when when you when you ask someone a question they can give you the answer or they can ask you questions to lead you to the answer yourself and and I and I said that that is the same as teaching someone how to fish, not giving them a fish, mm. and and that's what I mean about you know that's how he's changed the way that I think and how many people think because those same analogies that he would use would be the same analogies that I would then go and use to explain to other people, to teach other people how to fish. Right. And the, the the clearest and the easy one was to talk about, you know, the, the seeding of sovereignty. And the, he put it in the most simplest way. He said, would Ngāti Kahunganu allow Tūhoi to dictate to them what should happen on their marae? No. Okay, well, would Ngāpuhi allow Ngaitahu to dictate what should happen on their marae? No. So then why would we believe a crown narrative that our people all woke up simultaneously on the 6th of February and said, right, <laughs> we want to give it to some random woman on the other side of the world? Aye. It, you know, it doesn't make sense. Oh. And, he, and, he, and he would go further on to say, do you think Queen Elizabeth might just wake up one morning and go, hmm, I'm done. Uh, France, how am I? 
you fellas, you fellas carry it on. <laughs> you know, it, it, again, it doesn't make yeah. sense. And then, yeah, so, so he would use um, analogies like that to just be like, and then by the end you're going, ah, you're so right. Mine's <laughs> wrong. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, right. that was his, his magic way of telling a story and leading you to the answer and not just telling you. Mm, kia ora. Uh, tēnā rawaitu, kia koe hoa. Thank you very much for joining us today and for sharing these beautiful pieces of moana with us and with all of our listeners. Um, I encourage all those in Instagram land to uh, follow Safari on his Instagram, uh, Saf underscore te underscore peer, where he will continue to share lots of wonderful wisdom, I've no doubt. Um, you can also follow us on Instagram, uh, near Te Ao Māori Podcast. Um, once again, um, well, our thoughts go out to you, Ihoa, for the loss of your mentor. And our aroha goes out to all who knew uh, Matua Moana well, especially to Fano Pani. And I also want to give a big mahi to them for their manaki of, I mean, just everyone from everywhere that came to Matahiwi over the weekend. Um, it was a beautiful, beautiful occasion, and the uh, the food and the welcome was abundant and plentiful. So ngā mahi kia koutou katoa. Um, we will see you again in uh, two weeks' time. E huama. Thank you for listening. Come find us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and wherever you get your podcasts. And a massive thank you to Tiahe Butler, as ever, for producing the show. Tēnā koe e hoa. Ka kite anō. NAIR is public interest journalism funded through New Zealand On Air and brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network. It was hosted and researched by Leonie Hayden with Te Kuru Jews and Mediana Johnson. NAIR was produced by Te Aihe Butler with senior production from Jane Yee and project management from Mark Kelleher. Kia ora, this is Toby Manhire, here to urge you to tune in to Gone by Lunchtime, a podcast with me, Annabelle Lee Mather and Ben Thomas, tackling the world of New Zealand politics, from policy to polling, from scandal to psychodrama. Listen to Gone by Lunchtime, brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network, wherever good pods are sold. Are you curious about how business can be better? I'm Simon Pound, and I host Business is Boring, a podcast where I caught it all with some of the most interesting people in entrepreneurship, commerce, and making things happen. Tune in to Business is Boring every Tuesday, brought to you by the Spinoff Podcast Network in partnership with Smart Business Lab. The Spinoff Podcast Network.